Hello, everyone. Welcome to Future Cities Lab podcast. Here in Singapore, I'm your host, Thandi. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Future Cities Lab podcast. I'm here today with Dr. Anna Gasco and Dr. Naomi Hanakata, coordinators of the Gmo Project, a research project here at the Future Cities Laboratory in Singapore. Their research focuses on the impact of urban mega projects and contemporary urban development practices around the globe. Welcome, Anna. Welcome, Naomi. Thanks, Tanvi, for having us. Thanks, Tanvi. So, from what I understand, the image of the city today as much as its economic success is increasingly determined by single projects, urban mega projects, developments that are large in scale, often planned in one go and hosting a mix of uses with iconic architecture. When I think iconic architecture, I think of our very own Marina Bay area and the Marina Bay Sands building. How would you define a crop projet? How is it different from a regular architecture project? Well, you already pointed it out, the Grand Projet is indeed large in scale to begin with, a new piece of a city even in many cases, driven by grand ambitions. And it's often a lead project and a direct translation of political ambitions in economic agendas into urban form. Looking at our case study in Singapore, for example, the Marina Bay area, with the iconic Marina Bay Sands, we can see that it has become the face of the island state and is a good example of how these projects radiate capability, economic strength, and a sense of futuristic utopia. But we also define Grand Projets as very carefully laid out developments, often planned and overseen by a single authority, which consists in many cases of a very complex constellation of public and private stakeholders. But these projects are also locations of concentrated power. Power exercised by the people who realize such projects, but also by the projects themselves through the impact they have on local people, economies, landscapes, livelihoods, and the image of a city. Yes, and and to add to the definition, so since we believe power was a key component, I mean, is a key component, we chose the term Grand Projet, referencing the projects of former French President Mitterrand during the 1980s. So his eight monumental buildings project uh, that he launched transformed Paris' skyline in less than two decades. And for us, the term Grand Projet therefore carries the power message much more explicitly than the term urban mega project. You're both architects and urban designers. I would like to ask, why does this research interest you uh, at this time and this place? Um, Yes, so so first we should clarify that Grand Projets are not new phenomenon in our cities. Throughout history, large-scale and comprehensively planned urban projects have been part of the development of cities. I mean, look at Pope Sixtus' rebuilding program of Rome in the 15th century, which continues to provoke controversy today due to the heavy destructions and taxations it involved. Look, of course, at Haussmann's radical transformation of Paris in the 19th century. So Grand Projets are a matter of fact in our cities. And in our research, we have found that these projects have been increasing in both sizes and numbers over the past three decades all over the world because they provide effective tools, to kick off new urban development, but also to revitalize an area due to the power Grand Projet have and the finance that they draw, with thousands of square meters and the related profit margins. Luzadzu in Shanghai, for example, was the first special economic zone of China, where foreign investors were invited in the late 1980s. The project became a strategy for attracting foreign capital in the aftermath of the Tiananmen Square incident when the international community had largely cut off China. So, whether we like it or not, Grand Projets play an important role in our cities. And rather than just condemning them or criticizing these projects, as we thought, as researchers, we should take them seriously and try to understand 
what their challenges are, but most of all, how we can leverage on their capacities and potential to create more inclusive and more adaptive projects for future cities. Two aspects that are key in our research. What I find interesting here is not just the complexity of the Crow project itself, but the fact that you're looking at so many geographies. You talked about Singapore, Naomi, and then Anna, you mentioned Shanghai, Paris. You're bringing so many different cities in conversation across Asia and Europe. I wonder what commonalities or differences you see in this conversation. Yeah, I mean, that was an, one of the interesting questions we started off with. And of course, some of the commonalities are determined by the definition we came up with, right? So, for example, the large scale, the program diversity, the high density, and the important role these projects play within their cities. But maybe more interestingly, we came across um, very similar governing structures, for example, which is an, in many cases a specially created body which runs these projects and does so outside the established planning bodies or procedures. So, for example, in Madanuchi in Tokyo, we have the OMY Council, which is in charge of the project. And in Luzazui, we have the Shanghai Luzazui Development Company Limited. And in the case of Hamburg, we have the Hafen City Hamburg GmbH, just to name a few of those we were dealing with. But we also find commonalities within the project triggers at a very early stage, such as, for example, uh, the construction of the ECP Highway here in Singapore, or the Rose Garden Project in Hong Kong. In both cases, these infrastructural projects triggered the later on construction of a Marina Bay area and West Kowloon. But we also find commonalities in the ambition of projects to, for example, spearhead urban renewal processes in an area like King's Cross in London or 22 Ad in Barcelona. And the reasons for commonalities are not least because a high level of exchange between project governing bodies or even more so the people running these governing bodies, but also a direct modeling of other projects, taking other projects as a reference when a new project kicks off, and down to engaging the very same people, such as architects or developers. Yes, and if I can pick up on the differences, um, so we find many differences, of course, in the implementation process. The 22 Art project in Barcelona, for example, is characterized by private land ownership. And the 22 Art company developed a sophisticated framework that prevented expropriation while nevertheless allowing the area's redevelopment. Of course, this process requires a very long-term perspective and the redevelopment phases that last several decades. On the other hand, a project like Luzadu in Shanghai was built very rapidly by the government to showcase China capabilities to the world. Um, of course, we see different, uh, different approaches uh, to urban design. Um, Hafen City in Hamburg, for example, is based on a flexible framework plan and a complex phasing strategy that allows negotiation and spatial adaptation over time. An older project such as La Défense in Paris, on the other hand, is characterized by a fully drawn master plan from the start, which tried to envision what the city could be and ended up being outdated very quickly. We see differences, of course, in how projects are accepted, and this depends on many factors. Uh, the management of publicly accessible private open spaces being one of them. And there are many reasons for these differences. While these projects are linked to global networks and even try to copy the success stories of other projects, they nevertheless always land within their local conditions, their local process, which lead to an adaptation of any global scheme and to the development of a unique character for a project, sometimes more or less obvious in different places. So you both mentioned so many different examples and I realized that all of them seem to be very top down. As an urban designer, I have a fear. Is there a space for small-scale bottom-up projects in this world of mega-projects? Can the small-scale coexist with the Crow Project, or will they die out? Well, Tanvi, that's a very valid question uh, indeed. And the fact that Crow Projets are cancelling out smaller-scale projects is certainly one of the reoccurring critiques. 
Um, and it's true that in many cases, it is smaller buildings that are being consolidated in the process of creating mega plots for mega projects. However, our research has shown that grand projets do have the capacity to include a variety of scales without jeopardizing their articulated ambitions. The capacity to link and include different spatial scales, however, has unfortunately in many cases not fully been exploited in the past and needs to be leveraged on more in the future in order for projects to become more inclusive, I believe. Yes, and if I can add to that, um, our research has also shown that it's often only up to this specific governing authority that we mentioned uh, to decide whom to include in the decision-making process and whom not to include. And given the size and the impact of this decision, these authorities should have a greater public accountability to reflect a broader range of perspective, needs, and hopefully spaces. One of the private authorities we are talking about here is the private developer, the real estate investor. And they seem to play a key role in all of these projects that we talked about. In your case studies, how is this profit-driven approach of the investor balanced with the public interest of the authorities so that we can create a livable city for everyone, for the citizens and the economy? Is there a risk of diminishing power of public authority uh, over private capital? Hmm. That's a, that's a complex question. Um, so we have to keep in mind that the notion of public and private has very different meanings depending on the geographical and the governance context. So what we have seen as a trend is not at all private taking over public. And the fear that you've just described is one that we often encounter in Europe or in the West, let's say, but not really in Asia. Public doesn't always mean good and private doesn't always mean bad. There are many gradients in between. In Singapore, for example, the larger area of Marina Bay is planned and implemented by the Public Planning Authority, the Urban Redevelopment Authority of Singapore. And the still fairly centralized style of governance reflects the interest of a specific range of stakeholders, like the project of La Défense in Paris did in the early 1950s. On the other hand, the privately owned and developed project of King's Cross in London was developed in close collaboration with various stakeholders, including the local authorities and the local communities to a certain extent. So our research has shown that Grand Projets are governed by these exceptional bodies, which are oftentimes somewhat in between public and private and that show a complex overlaps of uh, public and private stakeholders. Uh, the EPAD in La Défense, the King's Cross Central Partnership in London, just to add to the ones that Naomi already mentioned. And what we found is that it's less the public or the private nature of these bodies that influence a project's capacity to be, for example, inclusive or to show a profit-driven approach, as you just mentioned, or even to achieve livable places. But it's more the extent of power and of control that these bodies have including power to select developers or architects, to control design guidelines, to monitor area access, for example. And of course, uh, in order to become more inclusive, cities should consider the new dynamic they introduce into power balances with these grand projects and realize projects only grow in quality and acceptance if um, the governing authorities act in dialogue with an interest of a broad range of actors in order to reflect a more diverse set of perspectives, voices, shaping and using these spaces at the end of the day. You've talked about uh, several different layers of complexity and so many different geographies and you have managed to distill this in your recently released book, The Grand Projet which uh, aims to provide applicable insights for planners, managers, policymakers, and urban actors. Can you elaborate a bit more on the development process of the book and your findings? Um, yes, it was indeed a grand challenge, if you will, and um, really investigating these urban mega projects only works by looking at real world examples and by doing extensive field work on the ground and speaking to the many different stakeholders involved in the making of these projects, including local authorities, developers, architects, and residents. 
So we came up with a methodological framework by, based on five key stages within each one of these developments. And these key stages are the conception early on, then the design, um, followed by the implementation, then the operation, and the implications, including the impact these projects have on the surrounding areas. Studying radically different projects within this same framework allowed us to consider the very specific notions each one of them have as well as create narratives that are comparable across the very different geographies. And introducing the comparative perspective here was crucial, not in order to compare project to project, that just would lead to the wrong conclusions, but um, we decided to look at five aspects that we believe are key for the understanding of these projects. And these are um, questions of borders, the borders these projects create or demolish within the, their cities, um, the role they play as urban catalysts for the city or the role that urban catalysts play within these projects. Then, of course, the question of centrality. Um, many of these projects form a new centrality that is changing the configuration and the dynamics within a city. And we looked at what I mentioned earlier, the interreferencing of projects. So projects taking other projects as a direct or indirect model for their design, their governing structures, or their daily operations. And last but not least, um, we looked comparatively at the spatial regulatory plan, so the designs themselves across these different projects. Yes, so this is for the, the analytical structure, our methodology, if you want. Um, and in terms of our findings, just to remind you, uh, the question behind the research were how are grand projets made? What happens when their grand ambitions leave their mark on, on the city, if you want? And in which ways can we create more inclusive and adaptive urban mega projects for the futures? And our conclusions highlight the multiple impacts Grand Projet have on many different scales and dimensions. And our findings also underpin the value of urban mega projects as pioneer for new regimes of governance, pioneer for new planning tools, new policies, etc. These projects are test beds for new urban forms and uh, new development practices. And they are great catalysts to revitalize urban areas. It's therefore crucial to leverage on their inherent capacities to transform, but also to improve the urban condition, as we already mentioned. And we don't have the time in this podcast to develop our findings. Um, you have to read the book for that. But I, I believe they can be categorized into two really broad terms, um, resiliency and equality, which link straight back to our research questions. For resiliency, Urban development is a process that never stops, right? And therefore, it faces the problem of time. And nowadays, massive drivers of change, such as digitalization and climate change, are causing important shifts and disruptive transformations for our cities, which with increased uh, pressures, cities are facing a high need for adaptation, a high need to be able to accommodate change. And our findings address those questions. And for the term equality, what all primarily spatially focused research raised was that, of course, any urban development on a grand scale needs much more than urban form and urban design. A grand projet needs an inclusive, participative, collaborative planning design process. It, it needs a non-discriminatory urban management and urban governance. And our findings provide some clues to ensure that the cities of the 21st centuries are built for all. I want to wrap up by asking you both a question. At the end of this research, do you have any one new question or challenge that has emerged for the future city? <laughs> well, luckily for us researchers, there are numerous new questions and challenges constantly popping up, uh, particularly for high density cities and in light of climate change. But um, maybe to bring up a question that has not yet been so prominently discussed is the question of how can we relearn patience? 
because a reoccurring critique of Grand Projets is their homogeneity, the homogeneity of their built environment. And this is not surprising as many of them are completed within decades or even less, naturally reflecting the needs, the architecture and the technological standards of their time. When a project is planned, it is expected to be finished tomorrow. In Asia, maybe even more so than in Europe these days. But if we look back in history, Grand Projets have taken centuries to be realized. The Vatican City, another Grand Projet, nearly took thousand years to be built. So the resulting question is how can we as a society think ahead without the need to determine everything today and without the expectation to have everything done by tomorrow? Yes, I mean, to very quickly wrap up, the, the question of change is crucial. What does change mean for the way we develop and manage cities? On that note, I would like to thank you, Anna, and thank you, Naomi, for this very enlightening discussion. Thank you so much, Tandy. Thanks a lot. <laughs>